Okay, I'm ready. Do it up. Are we live? We, we're, we're live, dude. We, oh, we oh shit. Live. Ah, shit. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode three in the trenches with myself, Grant Griffin, Zach Madeer, nailed it, Dylan Pierpont, and our guest today, Anthony Benedetto, aka Tony, aka Papa Tone, is in the house. And we have a guest, a co guest with Dylan. Passing through, Jay. Say hello, Jay. Hello. There, there he is. That's all you need to know. <laughs> but uh, today we're going to be talking about time management. So our guest is about as good as it gets with that. Like this guy, he's crazy. Right. He's first and foremost, he's a a uh, father, a husband. He's freelancer, student. And he just recently is now a minister, so he can also marry people. You need <laughs> all these things. So if you need an illustration and and want to get married, he's your go-to guy. So Tony, say hello. What's up? My, what's up? There he is. So, right. so Tony, Tony was a guy that uh, I think we've mentioned it before that we all went to the Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design, and I think that's where all of us uh, kind of met up. That's that's where I first met Tony. Was a few classes that we had um, back at school. Uh, was there anyone else? You you guys were saying Zach and and Tony. You guys met for the was it the orientation and the whole uh, not link crew. What do they call it? The, the, student student ambassador. Ambassador. the student ambassador stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we must have. We must have met. I think it's the. I just remember this redheaded dude. You know. <laughs> That's that it. Was, <clears throat> that was probably me. That and you were double major, right? Yeah, animation and. Uh, yeah. Illustration. See, I knew it. I knew it. Better yeah. you. And then we got me and Tony rocking out like uh, last year in Shore till 3 a.m. No, only kids on campus for for a while. That's how it still is. <laughs> Except now it's just you. Just me. <laughs> and you can't stay till three, right? No, they they change the rules. You can't stay in Shore till three now. Yeah, it closes that's... at like 11 or something. Oh, oh man. That's nice. All right, man. Well. Let's let's get into this. Let's talk some Game of Thrones. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> oh, Episode okay. eight. What the fuck? Are you caught up? Yeah, dude, I am caught up, man. I just just nice. got caught up. <laughs> Even currently on the episode, I about shit my pants on episode eight. What the fuck? Yeah. What it was the... awesome. <laughs> but, but on the real, I guess we can get get into this. So Tony, you don't have a very you don't have like the traditional art student path, you know. So I, I think we should get into that. So I think that's interesting. And uh, let's let's get a little little background information because before you you already had a career all all worked out. You're making some good money. You like built a house with your bare hands. You had the family already, and you were just rocking out. And well, then all of a sudden, I killed like, a bear with my bare hands. <laughs> what was that? I he, said before that I killed a bear with my bare hands. <laughs> and then he made the house out of its bones. He had to kill a lot of bears. Well, I like used his bones for tools and stuff. You know. Oh man, that's even cooler. No, but yeah, you're right. Um, I uh, as soon as I got out of high school, I um, was just really like, I need a job. I need money. I want my own place. I want my own stuff. I've always been that way, and I just like got into something. I had an opportunity, and I got into it. It was actually in the sheet metal trade, um, and so I started. Uh, as an apprentice in the sheet metal workers union and I did like a four-year apprenticeship with them and then I spent five years after the four-year apprenticeship just working in the in the field and yeah like you say during that time I got married I got married when I was 21 um, and then and before we got married we had uh, a house built, and I was the general contractor for that. Um, uh, and I was like 20 years old when I did that. And then, yeah, so we had the house built, we got married. Um, 
We had three children during that time. You didn't waste any time. Was... No, you got to get to it, you know? <laughs> and uh, But, yeah, that was just kind of my thing. I, I come from a really big family, and I always wanted a really big family uh, myself. And so in order to do that, I didn't want to be, you know, 55 with young kids and stuff. So I wanted to just get, get busy, you know, get started. Uh, so, yeah, I did that, but I s spent – eight and a half, almost nine years doing that, uh, doing sheet metal. And I did really well with it uh, as uh, you go through this four-year apprenticeship. But even during my apprenticeship, I was uh, taking on the role of a foreman where I was running crews on uh, large jobs. And then even from there, I became a project manager where I had my own office uh, and was doing more management for really large jobs. Um, and stuff like that, but I just didn't fit. Like I didn't, I, I'm a very driven guy. I work really hard, but I just didn't enjoy my work. I enjoyed it more when I was in the field and just hands-on building things. Um, but when I got more and more into the management side of things, I enjoyed it less and less. Uh, and so there just came a point where I just was tired of it. I just... It just was like the cliche of fitting a square peg into a round hole or whatever. Oh, and I just was tired of it. I was The last job I was on was down in Alamosa, Colorado at Adams State College. And it was an addition to the college there, uh, a really cool addition to their football field where they did dorms and all this really cool stuff. It was like a $6.5 million job just for the sheet metal and plumbing. So that's what I was managing. And I, uh, I had to drive down to Alamosa from where I lived in Pueblo West. And I had to drive down there every week and it was like a two and a half hour drive. And I was just leaving Alamosa to come back north to where I lived. And I just was like, I'm done. I'm done with this. I'm sick of it. Um, I don't wanna do this anymore. And I just kind of decided that was it. And so the next idea, you know, or the next uh, step in my train of thought was, well, then what do you want to do then? And there was no question for me. I didn't even have to think about it. It was I just want, I want to do art for a living. And I didn't really know at that point, you know, what specifically I wanted to do with art, but I knew I wanted to do art. And so I just... I decided to make a change. Yeah, ballsy. So, so after eight years managing and you know all those, just got off this huge, huge gig. You're like, eh, fuck it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do art now. This is. I mean, it, and it wasn't. It, it, it may sound like you know spur of the moment, like jerk, knee jerk decision, but it really wasn't. I mean, I had always known I was an artist. I had always been an artist. Even during that time, I had been working on my art. But it was only when I could fit it in. It was only when I could squeeze it in and it was always suffering or it was always, you know, secondary, tertiary to everything else. And so it was just like, I'm finally going to do the thing I've always known I should have done in the first place. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Nice. And so you were like, what, you're about 28, 28 then? When I was 28 years old. Yeah. yeah. That was in the summer of, uh, was the summer of 2000, actually no, it was the f summer of 2009 that I decided that, and then um, from there we had to, or maybe it was like late summer, early fall of 2009, and then from there I had to, uh, I had to sell my house, um, so we did that. I mean, you know, I it took a lot for me to like. That was the house you built. That's the house we built. Yeah. Oh, we, it was that like ripping a little piece of your heart out right there. Not really, dude. I mean, I I. It's funny because now, it, well, what happened was, I went from our house was you know it was a nice house. It was like 1,300 square feet upstairs and uh, 1,300 down, and we finished the basement. So it was like a 2,600 square foot house, five bedrooms, three bathrooms, 
that's a pretty good size. It was a decent size house, you know. It's not like MTV Cribs or nothing, but <laughs> it was nice. And I, uh, the hardest part though was going from that to our our now 850 square foot apartment, two bedrooms. That is the worst part. It wasn't so much that it was like, oh, my house, like, you know, whatever. It's a place. It's cool. But just the space has is, is been the hardest adjustment, you know? Yeah, big, big change. And that's with – did you have the fourth kid by that time? Or no, so when, when I decided to do it, summer of 09, I had three kids. Yeah. Uh, my, my third kid, my second son, Logan, was like – a year and a half or something. It was really little. And uh, and then I had, you know, two above him, a boy and a girl. And then um, we decided and we put our house up on the market and it actually sold really quick, which was cool. And we got what we wanted for it. We made some money on it too, so that was nice. And then rented a little apartment in Pueblo West for like the remaining six months of, uh, like the first six months of 2010 before we made the move from Pueblo to Denver to go to school. And so we moved up to Denver to this, you know, little cracker box we live in. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and then I started school August or sep early September of 2010. And then it was like a month into it that we were, we, we were pregnant again for the fourth time. <laughs> <laughs> which was the only one I can honestly say it was a surprise out of all four of them. <laughs> the worst possible time. We were not planning that one, but no. since then, we've had our, our fourth and final addition to the world, you know, and that's Griffin. And so, Name it was like after. three now. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, Matt likes to think I named him after him, but I didn't even know him. It had a big impact on you. <laughs> <laughs> no and then you left, dude, you, and you just and split my heart out. Like, I split. I just wanted you to name your kid after me, and then I was like, all right, my, my work is done here in Denver. Oh, uh, man. You, you be, you bewildered all, or you bewitched us, because I'm, I'm naming my kid Brant too, or Griffin too now. There you go. What there have you go. done? <laughs> But yeah, so that's what happened, and then and then I've just been in school. So all right, well, how was how was the change like with with the was was everyone really supportive the the white like was the the kids did you get some trouble from the kids having to like completely switch schools and how was that like so were you like, rolling at the same time you were rolling your kids too? Yeah, so what happened was is my oldest son was five when we moved. Um, and so he was starting kindergarten when I was starting college. So it was like the, he hadn't been in school yet. That's good. So we just like both started school at the same time. So it wasn't like we had to uproot him from school or whatnot. Yeah, but the thing was is my family's huge. Um, we're Italian and Irish, and so you, it's just like birth control doesn't even work on us. But uh, – <laughs> Yeah, so like my mom's from a family of 14 kids, 10 girls and four boys. My mom and dad had four kids. Us, I have three brothers. There's four of us. We were like the smallest family um, in our entire family. But in Pueblo, there was three families that lived there, and so we were all really close. So that was hard for the kids, but even more so, I think, for my wife because they ha we had all this – really tight-knit group of people all around our age with young kids and stuff and then we just left all that so that was hard but like the kids you know they were like whatever they didn't really know what was going on you know wait were your were your your kids are homeschooled though right so you didn't have to now they didn't are. have to all that i forgot about that now they are but now, oh so they weren't at the time when did joe no nah, so joe joe my oldest son joseph he uh he started kindergarten and did first grade at public school, and then after that, um, my wife chose to homeschool the kids. Gotcha. Because gotcha. she's a baller. I don't know how she does it, dude. I don't That's know how she does it either, man. <laughs> well, that, is, that is a full-time job plus some with four kids and teaching yeah, and all that. you got to love that.
I, I, yeah, she's crazy. That's all I have to say about it. Uh, yeah, it would have been a lot harder if you didn't, you didn't have her, I would imagine. She's like the rock. I couldn't do it without her. That's good. That's good. All right, well, what was the transition like for you from, you know, your full-time gig managing all this stuff and then going down to a, you know, full-time student? Well, you, you know, it was the hardest thing, I think, for me at first was um, – just worrying about money, you know, uh, because it's, it's one thing if it's like, oh, I'm just me, I'm just a single guy, and I'm just, you know, I just got an apartment, or I'm living with folks or something, you know, uh, but when you have, like, a family who, and my wife doesn't bring in any income because she's busy raising the kids and stuff, and so it's hard because my thing is, like, I just have to provide, you know, uh, and trying to trying to get things sewn up and, and working out in that regard was, was probably the biggest adjustment because I had been in a really good position and I was, you know, fairly high up in the company and had been for years where I didn't even think about my paycheck, you know, like it just came every week. I didn't even like check the amount. Uh, I think it was like direct deposit too. And I, it was just 40 plus hour. I was on salary you know, and so it was just like, I didn't even think about that for at least the last, you know, five, six years. And then now it's like, what am I going to do? How am I going to pay the bills? Where's the money coming from? Kind of thing. That was like the biggest adjustment for me. Yeah. So how did you resolve that issue? Because I, I was just trying to provide, you know, with one person and that was fucking scary as shit. And I was still like, you know, calling up the, the fam like begging for for some money, you know, <laughs> in a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, so uh, it's just a, I I just had to like pound the pavement kind of thing, but not really the actual pavement. I mean, I guess I can tell you one story about a good connection I made. If you guys want me to. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. So, so when I moved up here, right, it was it was the summer. We moved up, uh, I think it was July 1st of 2010. And, I, you know, like I said, I had been at this place for a long time. And even though I had quit, basically, uh, they, uh, they gave me a layoff. And I, I was able to collect unemployment for a while. So I had, um, you know, some a little bit of breathing room uh with that and I was like well I have to do something I have to have a job I have to be doing and even if I don't have like a job job I have to be doing something because that's just my personality I can't I can't not be doing things um but anyways I had a good friend of mine who lived in Denver and his dad was uh like a director vice president of this commercial production house here in Denver. Um, the name of the company is Impossible Pictures. And they did, they, did, they use illustration um, very minimally, but they did commercials for, you know, big networks like Discovery Channel, Military Channel, Dish Network, uh, on and on, like these, these fairly well-off television uh, companies. And... They did like commercials for him for this, for that, whatever. Um, and I had been, you know, friends with the family for quite a while. And so I just went to uh, my buddy's dad and I just said, Steve, do you have any internships available? You know, like I kind of knew it wasn't really in the field of, of the creative uh, pursuits that I kind of was looking to get into, but it was something in, in that realm. And I was not do anything at the time and I just I had to do something and I said hey just let me know if you if you want to take on an intern or if you have anything available and they had an internship program it was a little unorthodox but it, they had one and he said yeah come in you know let's do it but it was unpaid and um, so I did that uh, for the whole month of August before I started school and I went through like all the different uh, departments in the company um, so it was like production um, editing 
and creative and then like the operations for the business. Uh, but it wasn't in that order. It was production, editing, operations, and then creative. Um, so I did that for a month, and then that ended, and then I started school. But I met people there, and um, I finished my first year of school, and it, it was the summer of 2011, and uh, I reached back out to those guys, and I said, hey, do you guys have any work? Um, and they said, yeah, we, we, we could use some storyboards because that is where they use illustration is storyboards for their, for their commercial spots. And I said, yeah, I'd love to do storyboards. And I went in and in their office and did some storyboards and stuff. And while I was there, one of the people who I had met the previous summer said, oh, hey, how you doing? And it's good to see you again and all that. An editor, actually. And she... Uh, she said, hey, give me your contact information. I didn't know you drew and all this stuff. And I was like, well, yeah, that's what I do. You know, like, I don't know why she didn't know that that's what I did. But maybe because I was interning for a commercial production house, she thought I did other things. But when she saw me draw on board, she was like, yeah, yeah, give me your information. And I didn't really know why. And then like a week later, she said, um, oh, she called me and she said, hey, I'm leaving this company. I'm going to go work for this other company. And we need illustrators. And I said, yeah, I'd love to do it. And I made like a really good connection. And I've been doing illustration for these people ever since. And it pays really well. And so that was a really good connection and opportunity that came by just doing things and meeting people. Damn. So right. my, I, I got a question about that. Because at that point, you said you had taken that internship it was about a month, you said, before you started school. Mm -hmm. So to, to take an internship, especially one that, that you know ahead of time is, is kind of, I mean, it's unpaid, um, and you know you're not going to be making an income when you when you got to be making an income, um, having just left this, this previous career, uh, what was kind of like the draw to get on board with something like that? Was it always in hopes that there would be connections and, and mm -hmm. things to, you know, happen later on down the road? Because that's a that's Absolutely. a pretty big commitment to make, knowing full well that, you know, you're not going to be making any money, at least in the beginning. Absolutely. That's what it was. I mean, it was like, I, to me, I'm a very, very firm believer in um, meeting people. You know, and it's it's great. The digital age is great. I love it. I try to utilize it as much as I can. Um, but honestly, I've been on Behance for four years now, and I've never once got a job from it. I've, you know, dabbled in the Elance thing for a while, and I never got any work from it. I, uh, I've tried these other avenues, and the things that work for me are when I meet people face-to-face, and they see me and all the things that come with that. You know, they see my work ethic. They see uh, my demeanor. They see my professionalism. They see my work. They hear me talk about it. Um, I can, you know, uh, I can connect with them as far as uh, their work is concerned and how I may fit into that. All those things, I think, work so much more in your favor when you can actually meet people. Um, and so I just knew, and especially because coming from my old career, I had got the job because I knew some people, and they gave me an opportunity, excuse me, and then they, you know, I, I, I was able to impress them, and, and then I got more opportunities that way, and so on and so forth. So I just knew if I, I have an in here to some degree, I know this guy, um, if I can just get there, then I don't know what's going to come of it, but it's something in the realm of, of the creative pursuits and I'm not doing anything right now. See, this is the, tr the thing I was faced with was I said, well, I could go get a job at just wherever, you know, some retail spot or uh, whatever, some nine to five at this point before I started school. And believe me, I did look at those, but nothing was really panning out. And I just decided, man, I, you know what? I don't want to just get some nine to five. I don't want to just settle for some uh, menial job. I would rather 
pursue things. You know, I spent eight and a half years doing something I, I kind of didn't really like. And I'm just like, I'm past that. I was just like, I'm done with it. I'm just going to pursue th something else. And so I did it for those reasons. I did it because I knew, you know, and it was, it was great because I realized, okay, these guys use storyboard artists all the time. And if you're uh, an illustrator that's able to do uh, typographic work, they use that all the time in their commercial spots. If you can do, um, you know, there's just a variety of different things they did actually use there that I realized, hey, this could be a potential for me. And I do, I've freelanced storyboards for them several times since then for other spots and stuff too. But, yeah, it gave me some work and it gave me connections to other people, you know, which I think is super important. Totally. It's most the most important. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I just I... prefer it that way too. Yeah. Doing doing like the doing the groundwork or the the legwork, I guess. Uh, and it's sad because that that's getting harder to do these days. Because now it's just everything is just through. But even all right. So even now that a lot of things are email. Like I remember you freeling. You were always you always find a way to talk face to face with your employers. It seems like you you're usually always on before the job. You're either on the phone. At worst, but at best, you're usually on like a hangout or using Skype and talking about the work. Yeah, absolutely, dude. I, I just like. I mean, there's been a couple clients I've had, you know, where I never actually saw their face, just like their Google profile or whatever. Um, but I just prefer to actually, you know, make a connection, and I actually, hopefully, I'm able to take my career to a point where I get to work. Uh, with people, direct contact with people a lot because I find we're just so much better that way. I think collaboration is where we're at our strongest, in my opinion. And so I'd rather be like, that's why I meet with my clients because I'd rather be seeing you and you seeing me and let's feed off of each other's energy and inspiration and, and stuff like that um, rather than just be this, you know, cold emails, cold emails, this, that, and the other. Like, I, I, I remember when you were uh, just graduating and starting to contact some clients and stuff, I kept telling you, just call this guy, you know, <laughs> and, like, get on the phone with him and say, hey, you know, here's what's going on, here's why my pricing is as such, and it's so much better when they can actually hear your voice and you can hear theirs, and just so much better, in my opinion. Definitely. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think that is... It's, it definitely builds a totally different relationship with your with your employer in the work, and it really, in the long term, it saves time because shit can get so convoluted through oh, yeah. emails and misunderstood. And I, I need to transition to to more your your outlook on this, but I still do the email thing, and it fucks me from time well, to time. And yeah, I think you're right on it, dude, because you you're saying. Well, it, it saves time, or it, you know, it sacrifices time when you when you do it that way. But I think we think initially, oh, well, I don't want to, you know, like you, we think it's easier for us to just shoot an email or whatever, but it's actually harder, you know. Um, like you said, things are just confusing and over the email. And, and I'm a very direct kind of guy. Like it in my old career, I was managing, I was project managing in the latter like four years. And I hated it because it was all pricing, this, that, and the other, you know. So as far as in relationship to like a uh, an illustration job in in the trades, in the building trades, um, it'd be like, let's say, for instance, you get a job with a client, you're doing a card for them, and they, they agree on the thumbnail stage, and you go into uh, the final stage or whatever, and then they come back and say, after they've approved it, they say, hey, no, we want to change this, that, and the other, you know. And then you're going to say, well, I want additional funds to do that because we had agreed upon this or whatever. That would be similar to what we call the change order. They still call it change orders in, in creative fields too, but in the field, in the construction industry, I would have to do these change orders, and I would have to be pricing and uh, how many hours it was going to take us to make this change and how much of materials and how, all this, so on and so forth. And I'd have to try and convince these general contractors um, it's going to cost this much and here's why. And I hate that kind of thing. I hate the fact that 
I have to kind of like try and convince you or BS you uh, into something. And so for me, it, it it's the same as far as talking to a client here with us. I'd rather not like, you know, send six different emails talking about all this stuff. I'd rather just pick up the phone and say, hey, here's what's going on. Here's what my pricing is. Here's why. What do you think? What's your side of it? Get their information and then reach an agreement together, you know, and like cut out all the back and forth, you know? Yeah, for sure. Save time. My, yeah, my, my problem is I always feel, I, I think I just, just scare myself that I'm going to say something stupid. I The same reason, this is the exact same reason I don't leave voicemails to anyone because I'll just start <laughs> rambling and then I'll, it'll be like a five minute thing of me just sounding like an idiot. <laughs> Because, like, even with emails, like, I will waste so much time coming up with an email. I don't know if y'all do anything, but it takes me so long to email clients because I think about every single word, and I go back, and then I'm like, oh, no, they're going to think this if I write this, when it would just probably be easier if I just, like, you know, <laughs> called them. You know, maybe, like, scribble something out prior to have a guide to go off of. And it's and just, like, hours on the email. I don't know. You know, I found that if you got to relax about stuff, you know, like... Uh, when I was in the trades, I would, I would, I mean, think about this. I mean, you're, you're getting all nervous and whatnot about, you know, calling a client or, or talking to them or whatever. And then maybe it's like, you know, a $2,000 job, right? Maybe mm -hmm. you're doing an illustration for two G's. That'd be great. Um, and I, I mean, I was putting together change orders that could be sometimes 50 grand, and I got to call the, the general contractor, basically, which would be your art director, and tell him, this is going to cost you $50,000, and you need to go to your owner, the owner of the building, the people with the money, and tell them, hey, you need to pay us, and then they mark it up to, you know, 60000 bucks or something, and here's why, you know. So I had to, like, convince them of these huge things, and I even, in that, under that scale or under that amount of responsibility had to realize like, Hey, don't sweat it so much, you know, like it is what it is. It costs this much to do it, you know? So I would say the same advice for like contacting a client is just relax a little bit. You know, you don't have to think about every possible retort or response to something they may say. It's we're all just trying to make a living and do some cool work and, you know, just feel them out. Be honest. That's my biggest thing. Be honest. People who are trying to hide something have to be all, like, sketched out, you know. I feel like just if you're honest, then it'll work out for you. Or it won't, and you're probably better off it didn't work out with that particular person, you know. That's a good point. That's a Yeah, that's a really good point. I just had a client contact me recently, and uh, they kind of they, they turned me down after I quoted them because uh, I charged too much, but um, even that, even just like quoting correctly at the beginning, you know, like saved me the time of having to be kind of jerked around mm -hmm. by them, you know, like, the headache. Ask, yeah, yeah, maybe them like demanding too much stuff and all of that, and mm -hmm. it was just, it was a nice thing, and it also wasn't, you know, later I told them, I even, I even said like, you know, it, Maybe maybe you guys can, maybe we can find an in between. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe we can uh, maybe you guys can limit your scope a bit, and we can we can work together. But that, you know, that that didn't take you know that that uh I wasn't able to do that from the get go. That took a couple that mm -hmm. took a couple um jobs and a couple emails with people. But everything you said is is true. I mean, if I'd have if I'd have really listened to that from the get go, I could have been able to do that from the start. Yeah, and it's just a delicate balance, I think, you know, where it's like you don't want to get taken advantage of, and I think sometimes people uh, out the gate get too like, oh, demand, you know, demand your price, and yeah. you're worth it, and all this, which is true, but at the same time, if you come off uh, abrasive like that to a client, and I learned this in, in the sheet metal trade as well, where I would like, Come on, and I'm just an abrasive person anyway, so I would come off like, this is what it's going to cost, you know, to these guys, and then it would just it would just hurt my, my chances of getting things to go through successfully and whatnot too. So I feel like you just need to be open 
and honest and and show them, hey, you know, this is it. You know, like I've had to tell clients a lot, you know, hey, this is what I charge and here's why, you know. Um, and it, there doesn't need to be any hostility about it. And then, you know, make a decision. But like you said, also offer up, hey, I'm willing to work with you guys. I'd like to do the work, so let's let's talk, you know. Because yeah. you brought just, up. Yeah. No, sorry, go ahead. Well, no, I was saying earlier you brought up a good point about um, how it seems easier to kind of to kind of go the the well the easier route. It's easier to go the easier route in the beginning, or so it seems. It's actually harder. You're just kind of adding. You, the amount of work stays the same. It seems like you're avoiding it, but you're just putting it all at the end, and you're going to have to deal with all these things that have mm -hmm. like now escalated and and piled up and maybe even gotten worse. And so yeah. if you reach exactly. that point where you, at the beginning you didn't clearly say, I can only do this much for that, or, or you didn't ask them what they expect of you, it's because you wanted to avoid confrontation. It's going to be, mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't even always need to be confrontation. You think it's going to be a confrontation. Yeah. So, That's my point. We, yeah. we have maybe like this predisposition that there's going to be confrontation, and I don't think that's healthy. Mm -hmm. You need to be... I mean, we need to react if there is confrontation and react uh, in, in the best way, but really we should go into it just being open and saying, okay, hey, I'd love to do this, but this is what it is. I mean, I think Grant was even in the room one time when I had these guys approach me about actually doing some card illustrations for a company they wanted to start up, like a card game, like a like a magic kind of a card game, and they were like, said, hey, we like your work, and we'd like you to do the, you know, some illustrations for us. And I said, okay, let's have a meeting. And, again, we had, like, a Skype meeting, and there was a couple of them that were – there was, like, three of them on the other end, and it was me. And we talked about stuff, and we did stuff, you know, and then um, we got to the subject of price. And I said, you know, well, what do you guys have in the budget, you know? And they were, like – they kind of did the, the traditional, like, just answer that with asking you the same question kind of thing. Oh, who are you budgeting, you know? And and instead of being, you know, real gun shy or whatever, I just said, well, you know, I don't know because each card to me is specific or each illustration may be specific. If you want just an item, it may be a lot more simple than, you know, like a multi-figure composition. But let's just say it's a single fig. Like I gave him an example. I said, let's just say it's a single figure composition, but it's detailed figure in a background, um, and all that is rendered out really nicely. And I gave him like an hour range. I said it's probably going to take me about these many hours, and I charge this much per hour. So you're looking at this much for the image. And I just told him that, and they they, they were they like, advance. yeah, they were like. <laughs> Uh, well, and they started saying all this stuff about, well, you know, we're, you know, you could get residuals or some nonsense <laughs> about all this stuff. And I said, I said, guys, I, uh, you know, I got bills to pay, you know, I got mouths to feed and I can't work for that. I just can't even do it. Uh, you know, but I said, I, I might be willing to do it for this. And I, I think I got down to a, a, a more, you know, a reasonable price from where I had been, and and they they just couldn't do it. Yeah. And I was just like, well, let me know, you know, if you guys want work in the future. But what I did is establish with them, this was going to cost if you want me to do it. But there's no like animosity. There's no right. conflict. It's just this is what it is, you know. Yeah, I think that's a a prime example because all of that took place in like under 20 minutes, and y'all established everything and worked out prices, negotiated did all this and it, it just didn't work out. But it, the, the thing was you like humanized the whole thing. You didn't like, you weren't getting intimidated or like that, you know, afraid that they were going to get sketched out. And I'm sure it saved a bunch of haggling because if you're doing that via email, like it could have gone on for like a week. Like sometimes you, they won't hear back from them. And then you're like second guessing yourself the entire time. Like, Oh, I shouldn't have said this, blah, yeah. blah, blah. Uh, and then, you know, they might not get back to you for a couple of days and then, it, and that's for like one email and then you give them a price and then maybe two days later they get back to you and they're like, no, it's too hot. And, and, and again, sometimes you can't always do the direct and, and, and sure. people are busy and sometimes people don't want to 
do that. Oh, you're on the phone, you know? Yeah. But you, I think you always make a point to, in the email, because I, I remember you, you telling me this, and I think I, I used that once, was like, all right, well, I, here's my phone number. Um, mm-hmm. Give me a call, and let's just do this in person and, you know, save all that. And then it'll, then you can find out, like, are they going to be willing to do this, or do they just want to, you know, screen the emails and stuff. Yeah, and like not, you know, to get so far off the topic of time management, because I know that's what this is focused around, but really all it all ties together because it's like, to me, if you can meet somebody and establish a relationship with them, an actual relationship, not just, oh, it's so-and-so, you know, over the internet, you're, it's going to work out for you so much better. Like, I, I have been able to keep a client for many years because of that because I met somebody um, and I've shown them in person time and time again I'm, I'm here let's do it let's I'll work hard for you and I'll kill it and we'll have a successful project and let's do another one you know um, and you can do all those things via you know uh, the internet uh, or electronic communications, but it's so much more powerful if you can actually make a relationship with these guys. If they know you, they see your face, um, you know, uh, they see that you're, you're like, let's say you had like a midway meeting on a card or something, and you actually saw the art director, and he saw you, and you said, and he said, hey, I know you're struggling with this, but we really need it, you know, by tomorrow night. And you said, I'll give it all I got, you know, and he saw that and then you came through and you hit the deadline. It's so much more powerful to me than it's just like, hey, you're a number, you're on the other end of this line or whatever. We need it in 30 hours, better have it kind of thing. So much more powerful and I feel like you just create so much more uh, longevity with your clients like that. Yeah, that's pretty... It's pretty boss. Yeah, exactly. Like, like what the thing I really you, you said exactly it. Like you're you're just a number of builders because a lot of these times, especially for for card companies, you're not the the only illustrator. They have lots of people they're outsourcing to, and if you can be the and most people will just you know stoop to just doing the emails like like myself. And, but if if for some reason they cut back on the work, the the odds of them going with someone that they've had in contact in person and know versus the guy they're just emailing, they're probably going to lean towards that guy because they have a face to the name, there's a trust relationship there, and it's a little more human as opposed to, you know, number two email guy, you know. Yeah, or, you know, so-and-so over the email kind of thing, you know. It's like, again, collaboration. It's like if, okay, so basically if you're an art director, you know, or let's say you're a studio, which you guys have experience with that, and, and you get a client, you're a studio, you get a client, and the client says, we need these many card illustrations, and, and you, as the studio, say, we're going to bid it at this much for all those illustrations, and the studio is trying to make money. So they're no different than a construction company or any other company where they hire out a service from somewhere else and provide that to, to a client, and so they're they're saying we need to make money and so they contact all these illustrators and they say you guys have to do these card illustrations for this much money that's business you know um, but if that studio or that client sees you and knows you and feels like you're part of the team you're part of the, the overall thing hopefully they're not just driven by money and they're in a field because they you know uh, feel that it's a good field, like they want to work in, they want to create and, and add something good to the world. Hopefully there's that too, but still, they feel like, hey, this guy wants to be a part of this thing that we're doing. It's so much more uh, powerful that way because, like I've had, I just actually finished two projects with that same company I made that initial connection with through that internship prior to school like two weeks ago I wrapped up two projects with them and I did one project and then they hit me up and they said hey we got this other project but it's a rush project and so it's like a super tight turnaround 
can you do it? But because I've built such a good rapport with these guys and I've shown them time and time again and they know me and they know I have a family and they've seen my kids. I'm friends on Facebook with like the creative director at the company, you know, because they know me, they show me that respect. They say, hey, can you do it? Will this fit? And I just, which I usually do, even if I can't fit it, I fit it. I just say, absolutely, let's do it. You know, and I like was able to, and they said, and we'll kick you this much extra money for doing this project rush for us. And I said, let's do it. Great. And I was able to knock out another project and make some money like in a very short time. But I was like, hey, these guys are helping me out. They're giving me work. I'm helping them out to get a project done for them. We're, we're working together. That's just the best possible way to work with your clients to me is like as a team you know? when it Tony when it comes to those and, and however frequent or, or rare those rush jobs are um, you know you you have commitments to family and, and stuff like that as well uh, so when it comes to a job that you know pops up last minute and that's gonna start cutting into uh, you know personal time with with the family and kids what I don't know what what kind of um, what what kind of tactics or what kind of things do you do to help uh, help out in situations like that uh, where it was kind of unexpected and and you know now it's now it, it's kind of eating away at, at the time that, that you normally set aside for mm -hmm. for other priorities. Uh, how how do you handle situations like that? Because I think that's one of the things that I I don't have uh, the the same kind of responsibilities that that you do at this at this time. So I would imagine that being able to do that time management um, and be extremely efficient at that is is hugely important to being successful both as a father, as a husband, and you know as a working professional. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, no, that's a really good question because it's hard. But I feel like I think for all of us, it's 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 a matter of you know when you're starting out, basically in a field. It doesn't matter. I think any field. Even even in I can look back on my previous career, it was the same. When you're starting out, um, you have to build something. And it was interesting to me because when I quit my old job, I went to my boss, and he's actually my wife's uncle, actually. And I went the owner of the company, and I went to him and I told him, "Hey, I'm, I'm going to leave," you know. And we left on really good terms, and he was a great guy. But when I went to him and I told him what I was going to pursue, uh, he said, well, you're basically doing exactly what I did in the fact that he started his own company. And at the time, I didn't really understand what he was talking about, but as I got more and more into my, my pursuit to be an illustrator, and especially during school being a freelance illustrator, I realized he was exactly right, that you're building your business. And with that being said... Um, man, when you when he started his business, he and he was doing heating and air conditioning, where they make ductwork systems for for huge commercial industrial uh, buildings. Uh, he was working out of his garage, so he was like, he got like some equipment, and some tools and stuff, and had like his brother and a, and another guy, and they were like working out of their garage, his garage, you know, when he started, and and he's worked and worked and built up to where now he has a, a business and a, and a nice facility and state-of-the-art equipment. and They do huge jobs, and he's, he's done a good job. He's, he's very successful at business. But it's the same type of thing. So you got to do what you got to do. I say all that to say you got to do what you got to do. So for me, and especially I think as a freelance uh, artist, when they come, they come, you take them. So you do whatever you got to do to do them, you know. And for me, it's a matter of, you know, feeding kids. And uh, so my wife is, and she's just great, and she understands. So it's like if a job comes, I just do it. I do whatever I got to do, you know. Um, and then when we have the downtime or the time in between, then we, then we make up for it, you know. Uh, but like I uh, recently, Grant mentioned this stuff about me being a minister, which is 
a funny story. But I did like officiate a wedding for a buddy of mine. And we did it at the Grand Canyon. And uh, but anyways, I was like getting ready and I was about to fly out to Phoenix and do this thing. And this client, the same one I'm talking about, um, called me up and they said, hey, we have this other job, which is a, another cool thing because it was a job that I don't usually do for them. But because I'm very dedicated and I'm always there, they came to me and said, hey, they were doing like, I think it was a job for like Horizon Organic and they were doing like this like uh, web comic kind of thing or... Uh, I think it might, maybe it was even like an infographic, but it was like in a comic book style. Uh, and they were inking, digitally inking a bunch of like panels. Uh, and they said, hey, can you like ink some of these panels? We're like on a rush deadline. Can you ink some of these panels for us? And they sent me like an example of what one of their in-house illustrators was doing. And I said, yeah, I could do it. And they had me do like a, a rough, like a quick uh, test to see if I could ink like this other guy was, but it was simple. And they said, yeah, do it. So get as many panels as you can, you know. And I said, well, I'm flying out, you know, to Phoenix. I think this was a Thursday. And I said, I'm flying out to Phoenix. You know, this was Tuesday, like afternoon, they called me. And I said, I'm flying out to Phoenix Thursday. And so I only had like Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday to do it. And they said, well, just get as many as you can. And so I just set up on the kitchen table and just – started working and inked as many panels as I could in that time. And then they understood and I just, and then I packed up and flew out to Phoenix and it worked out. But that's the thing. When you get the work, you got to just do it. You know, mm -hmm. there you go. just fucking do it. Just do the damn thing. Well, <laughs> that. well obviously you got to weigh the things out, Dylan, you know, like if it's like, Hey, this is like 200 bucks or something that I could get. 500 bucks or something I could get doing some some task but I you know I told my girlfriend that we would you know go out to dinner for our anniversary well then you you might want to think twice you know but <laughs> or you just tell her hey with the money I make we can really go out for our anniversary so just let me get this work done you know you gotta you gotta weigh it out but I think the general gist is you just when you get the work and if it's work you want to do and you just got to do it. You got to make the sacrifice to get it done. You know, hopefully later in your career, you're solid enough. If you remain freelance or, or if you work somewhere that, you know, you have more control over your schedule, you know, I would, I would like it to get like that for me anyways. It, it definitely takes a, a certain type of person to be in a relationship with a freelance illustrator. Like not just <laughs> a partner can, can deal with that. Like, it's, and that's that's huge if you're going to be a freelancer because a, a lot of your time because when you're freelancing like you're not just doing the art like you got to do the business you got to mm -hmm. you know you got to hustle yeah. to get the work you got to correspond with people follow up you got to keep track of your your invoices you got to invoice you got to keep track of your bills um, mm -hmm. you know write offs taxes mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of people are like okay well you painted for eight hours what do you mean we can't go out to the movies tonight. Mm -hmm. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. It definitely does, you know. I mean, and, but it's like anything. You have to, I guess, try to align yourself with somebody that that understands or, or maybe even has similar pursuits, you know. Yeah. Because all right, all right. it's not going to work. Because this is a great talk and it's a good segue because uh, I am more on the opposite end. So, like, Anthony, I know – well, like, I, I relate with you in the beginning. Um, I was married once upon a time. And really? also, yeah. I didn't know this, Jay. Yeah, uh -huh. I, don't talk, I don't talk about my own personal stuff too often, as uh -huh. these people tell you. But uh, I was married at one time. Um, I, have, I have a daughter as well. Um, she is four now. She's a little bit older. Awesome. Um, but, you know, to go along with what Anthony said, um, you know, definitely, I mean, I was young as well. You know, I was like, 21, I think, when I was engaged. I was, like, 22 when I got married. You know, we had the house, did all that stuff. And, you know, to go along, you know, with what he said, it's like, yeah, you <laughs> – the budgeting of time, it's like you do whatever you have to do because it's like a different mentality, I feel like, because, you know, when you're on your own, you know, it's like you just got to worry about yourself. You know, it's mm -hmm. usually the bare minimum, you know. But, like, once 
once, you know, like a child is involved or, like, you know, a significant other, you know, the game has changed, like, forever. Mm -hmm. Like, it changes, like, everything that you do, everything about you, you know, where it's, mm -hmm. like, you know, you hear it all the time. It's like, oh, yeah, you just do what you got to do, you know, or, you know, you grind, grind, whatever. Like, you hear it all the time, but, like, I don't know. I feel like it has a different meaning sometimes because, you know, it's not just you that you're thinking about now. You exactly. know? So like, it really is the do whatever you can. It really is like, you know, you do everything. You, you're mm -hmm. trying to, you know, get whatever work you can. Obviously, you're trying to market yourself, build your brand, you know, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, doing whatever you can. If that means, like, mowing the lawn, sure. You know, you, you have to do whatever you have to do. And, like, all these, like, little, little things, like, contribute to, you know, that, you know, just do whatever you got to do. Um, but then to also <laughs> so way into uh, what Grant was talking about, like, relationship-wise, <laughs> It is very tough, you know, for anybody in the field because, you know, your 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 significant other really, I mean, it's a tough lifestyle, you know, as we all know. You know, you're painting or you know, you're modeling, you're doing whatever you got to do, you know, all day, you know, or, or you spend the majority of your time, you know, devoted to that. So, you know, the other person has to be receptive to that, you know. And, and I might be on the other hand where, you know, at the time, like, you know she wasn't, you know, so receptive, and, you know, that caused issues on top of mm -hmm. other issues and, sure. and stuff like that, you know. Um, so, yeah. I don't know, that was an interesting segue. I don't know if you guys have any, like, questions, because <laughs> I feel like I'm just ranting now. But. No, no, and I, I feel you for sure. I mean, I think that's why you have to just really be, again, back to that motto of being up front with people, you know. Hey, this is how it is, you know, with me, or this is how I am kind of thing. Yeah. Let's talk about it, you know. Um or as things change, you know, you keep open communication or whatever. But it, you're right. It ain't for everybody, you know. Yeah, it's um, not. That was the point I was trying to make. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> it's, it's not, not for everybody, you know. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> it's tough to get the balance sometimes. You know? <laughs> you know, I think kind of helps too, though. And my wife is super busy with a lot of things, you know. She's homeschooling and uh, taking care of the kids. And then before that, she was a childbirth educator, so she was – doing some classes with, with people. And so she has, like, and she has her English degree, her bachelor's in English and um, and whatnot. So she has, like, pursuits, too, that she's into. She has a lot of things that are occupying her time and that she's doing as well. And so that helps to balance things out, too, where it's not just, like, she's just, like, all over you all the time trying to get your, your time, but she also has a ton of things occupying her as well, you know. I think that helps too. Sure, for sure. And it, 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 definitely, what we do is kind of a an egotistical thing. Like it's it's very demanding of our time because it's not just like our passion. But then when you turn it into a career, it's kind of this weird. Because even even if you do have some free time, like it's all for for clients. You don't ever have time to do like your own stuff. Mm -hmm. So then, then trying to trying to throw that in there, like, that's a really tough one to explain, like, you're not doing client work, you're doing personal work, and you're not, you know, showing, giving your attention to significant others, that's a, that's a really a tough one to, <laughs> to And it's, it's like, you know, again, time management, right, or whatever, yeah. but, like, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm a very methodical person, and so it kind of sounds cliche for me to say, um, I'm not really big into even phrases like time management because it feels so like uh, dry. Yeah, it feels very forced. To feel like like it's a forced term. Yeah, not creative. Uh, it's like when in my old career, my boss gave me this uh, uh, book because I was the project manager. It was called the One Minute Manager, uh, and even just the title turned me off. I was just like get this out of here. I don't even want to read this because you know, it may have a lot of good information for management and stuff. But to me, I want things to be more uh, natural and more intuitive. Uh, and so that may not be the best advice for someone that really doesn't naturally manage their time well. But I think for a creative, you may have a system, but I feel like it's important to have a system that feels more natural. Uh, not like I take this much time to do this, and th then this time, all this, this blocked out time. I, I personally like it to be a little more natural. But with that being said, I'm like crazy with lists. I constantly have a list that I'm checking off, constantly. 
um, it used to be written for years. It was a written list, um, and my boss at my old career was was laughing at me because I have these lists, and I would put like a circle to the left of every item on my list, and I would put an X in that circle every time I completed one of those tasks. And he like just liked that I was that organized with like my my things I had to do. Um, and all my other things, and he actually asked me to put together like this curriculum, so to speak, for all the foreman, a foreman book is what he called it, and he had me like design how I manage, like how I foreman, uh, or manage my foreman duties, and I like put it into a book, and he made it the protocol for like all the foremen in the company, and got one of those, and were to follow those systems. So I'm naturally a very organized very methodical guy um, now my list is on my phone and it has you know Monday and it's not like a calendar for some reason that kind of bugs me to do it all on my calendar I just do it in my notes on my phone and on my phone I have a document a notes document that says Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday Saturday Sunday right and every week at random times though I don't have like Sunday night at 6 o'clock, I update my thing. I don't have that. As I think of something, I go to my list, I add it. I say, you know, uh, finish storyboards uh, for this job on Tuesday. And if I know that's going to go into Wednesday, I'll put it on Wednesday as well. And then I'll just close that, put it away. A day later, I think of this other thing or something else comes up. I put it on my list, like, religiously. I'll go to it and put it right then on my list and I check the list a lot you know so that's a tool I think that really helps me is this this ongoing list that I visit of things I have to do and when they have to be done I tried the calendar for a while but the alerts and stuff were driving me crazy <laughs> so I just well, and, got uh, to that timelines and deadlines change too yeah you know like yep. that's that's something I make I make lists um, I make a lot of lists. It's pretty mm -hmm. funny. I think that might be maybe a trademark of the creative personality. Um, uh, but I, I, yeah, I won't put. Uh, I kind of like I'll start it out and then I'll start grouping things in different different areas in it. I'll almost make like a rough draft list and then start another one with mm -hmm. things like arranged as like immediate goals, intermediate goals, and 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 future goals and. Uh, mm -hmm. or, things on the list and for sure just yeah, it's like, almost like just getting the just just the uh, act of getting it out of your head and putting on the paper yep. also helps you concentrate too yeah exactly because you can set it somewhere mm -hmm. you know like you can go crazy trying to think to, of all the things you have to do you know all your responsibilities and, and trying to keep that all straight in your head I just put it on there and then I can relax about it because I know it's there and even though, like, ten minutes later, I'll forget, what did I put on my list? Yeah. I don't really have to worry about it because it's there. And when I go back to it, then I'll be like, oh, okay. I think it's just about getting yourself in the habit of doing that. And so that you just habitually visit your list and go, oh, okay, yeah, tomorrow I'm doing this. Like, I'll do that a lot every night. I'll just be chilling or something. And then I'll just remember oh what am I doing tomorrow and I'll look at my list and there it is those three things or whatever are on there or that one thing or you know once in a blue moon there'll be nothing on the thing for tomorrow and I'll go yeah what do I want to do tomorrow and I'll add something you know but it's just a habit of of just keeping track of stuff you know well yeah. even Dylan Dylan you talk about like how when you finish Working on a painting for the day, you'll you'll save a um, a a version of what you got done today to or the the day before or the you know however many times you've been working on it to check and that's kind of what the list does is it becomes like a reference point for you. Exactly. And yeah, I'll make, exactly. I'll make uh, when I was doing illustration stuff. The stuff I do now, I I mean I I don't even have time to put lists for it. But when I was doing illustrations, I would. I would save out a thing and then I would go and make notes over it and, mm -hmm. and keep my uh, keep my my thoughts there. I kind of have this uh, the way I think about it is like um, 
if you keep that, if you don't put that stuff in a list, you've just got it on your in your head, and you're you're trying to keep like all these things warm. Uh, you know, like you've only got so many uh, heat elements on your the stove that is your brain, yeah. and you're trying to keep them warm all in the same time, and you need to get them out into the like the 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 oven, you know, the lamp or something. Like, go put them over there, and if you're trying to keep all this stuff heated at the same time, it, you know. It's, some of it's gonna go bad, so you're gonna go put it yeah. in the in the on the buffet line or something, and then you can go back and check. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> you, it made sense. I was just you... waiting for Grant to say something. But I, yeah. I feel you though, for sure. I mean, and then add to the mix, you have a wife, and you have three. I have four kids now. You have four kids, a wife, bills, friendships. You have to eat. You have to go to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. No, you start. Nah, having, not nah, nah. You Grant's start. Past the, he's got a yeah, cat. I got like that, bag. that NASCAR like that bag. <laughs> I just shit my oh, pants. <laughs> I'll take care of this at the end of the day. Ain't nobody got time for pooping. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, though. Like, so you add all that stuff to it. You have to do that. It's almost like a survival mechanism. Mm-hmm. You yeah. have to separate yourself from it almost. To, yeah, like, yeah. You, you know, you just have to say, okay, one thing at a time. I mean, so, like, I'm in my last semester here at school, and I worked it to where I only have one class. I have grad portfolio, that's it, um, this semester. And so this is the most, like, laid back, in a sense, semester I've ever had. It's actually the first time I haven't had an 8 a.m. class. It's amazing. But that's beside the point. Um, but before, when I had, you know, a full load of classes, I, I mean, you guys know how intense it is in, in here at RIMCAD. I mean, I was in, I was at school working on art 60, 70, 80 hours a week, you know. Um, and so... When, you, when you're in class that many times and you have these many responsibilities with this paper and this research assignment and these three illustrations and um, as most of the time I had, you know, two liberal arts classes and three studios, your workload is intense, but not to mention a family, a wife, freelance jobs to pay the bills. All these things can be easily overwhelming. Um, so it's like a survival mechanism. You have to say, okay, one thing at a time, you know, I can't, if I, if I don't organize this somehow, I'm not going to survive. I'm not going to be successful. And so you have to like separate it all out, put it there and then just one, one at a time, knock it out, break that down to like more of a simple analogy of just a, a painting or a project, you know, you have to take it in steps, you know? That's uh, actually, I was in preparation for this, uh, um, and and just with stuff I've been thinking about. I kind of was interested as to like what you know the schedules of like Olympic athletes um, are kind of like. I was taking a look at like sort of what their day looks like. I also have kind of a weird schedule, but one of the things that that came up was um, talking about their training a lot and how they manage their training because it's how they spend most of their day and. They they try to break it down um, to to the one you know doing one task at a time. Like if they got to do if they've got to run like a, a whole bunch of laps uh, or something, they they don't think about all ten laps they have to do. They think about one lap. Mm-hmm. They think about the next lap. And I think that when you've got a huge thing like uh, we used to have to do these cards you know, two, uh, in two days, and you would think about, oh, my, I have, like, five in this set, and even within one illustration, you've got all this stuff to do. Yeah, all these um, problems to solve. Yeah, all these problems to solve, and you, you got you to, gotta, like, approach them one at a time. I used to mm. get really overwhelmed by uh, all the things in an illustration, and I would just kind of, I wouldn't, I wouldn't you know, I wouldn't do it. I, w- I, would, I would focus on one thing and avoid all these other problems because... Mm. I couldn't see the forest for the trees. And, um, and I think that's where it comes down to a methodology, right? So as you do work, and in a particular type of work, you start to develop methods, um, you know, and you and you realize, I do this, then I do that, then I do this, then I do that, then I come back, I do these, you know, and then you get it down kind of to a science. 
and that helps things. That's what the list is too. You know, that's how I handle incoming information. You know, when someone tells me, oh, hey, this is what you have to do, then you put it here and you start down that path, you know. So it's just developing a method. And what's hard is adjusting to new work that doesn't fall within an existing method, you know. So it's like you're going to have some struggle time with that, you know. You've been doing cards for three months or whatever. And then you get a job doing concept art or something, you know, and things totally switch for you. Well, you're going to have some adjustment period, you know, but that could be fun too. You can look at that as like, hey, it's, it's you know, livening up the situation. It doesn't get stale like that. Yeah, definitely. Well, real, real quick, and then I, wanna, I wanna definitely want to get back back on track with, with this, but I want to tangent a little bit because I'm, I'm interested. Would you say... Because you you were working, you know, you were eight years, you're doing doing your thing, and then you decided to drop and then go, you know, start taking school and change your career in art. Would you say that your mind, like, would you change anything? Like, if you could go back, would you start, um, you know, change your path earlier? Or do you think that experience that you learned eight years as a manager completely altered your mindset to be more efficient? with work and planning and instead of like, you know, being that punk high school kid that just goes strictly into art school and has no fucking clue and thinks mm-hmm. everything again. Cause, cause a lot, that's a hard mindset. Cause I, I, you know, that's what I did. I went, you know, high school, then I went to college and I'm, I'm going to be an artist now, but I did, I had no idea the amount of work that it would be. It took me three years of like dicking around. Cause you were saying you were like putting 70 hours and I was not doing that. Like I was, you know, still going out and, with friends and drinking and doing all this stupid shit, and I didn't really have the the knowledge to take it seriously as as I should have at an earlier stage. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was kind of curious. Do you think would you well, change anything, or do you think that was you know um, important in the transition? Well, you know, it was definitely important because I feel like I'm not the type of person who thinks who who's like, oh, you're gonna make a mistake. I mean, I am when it comes to my work, and I can be gun-shy sometimes. Uh, In that respect, I think we all deal with that as artists, but especially initially. But I don't, in life, feel like you need to be so overly concerned with, well, if I would have done this, or I should have done that, or maybe this. It's all speculation, Mm -hmm. Um, you know? And, and, but, but I will say, while I was in the sheet metal trade and I wasn't pursuing art uh, as a career, I was always like, man, I should have just went to school. What if I would have just started that? You know, um, because actually I did, when I first graduated high school, I had a job and I was working at a restaurant. And then um, my, my dad had, uh, has a brother who lives back in Chicago and I went back there and worked for a summer out in Chicago when I was 18. Moved back to Colorado after that and didn't really have anything going on. I didn't have a job. And I, I was 18. I had decided, you know, I would like to look into art school, you know. Something that's sad about that, I think, is I really didn't know anything about them. I, I wasn't exposed to art schools back then. Uh, yeah. No one told me anything about it. I figured they had to exist, and I'd heard about them, I guess, but I couldn't have named a single one. I was totally green in that respect, and I remember I called up one of my old art teachers, and I had asked him, hey, do you know any of any art schools, you know, uh, or can you recommend any? Or And he just, I don't know, I don't think he had, like, a traditional education, Um He's an excellent artist, but I think he's kind of more of a self-taught artist. He didn't really have much information. And at that point, I kind of just let it die. And I pursued other things and got into sheet metal and and it went that route. And I had always thought to myself, if I would have just stuck at it, if I would have just kept at it and kept researching, I could have started art school back then, you know, and I wouldn't have spent however many years doing this other thing, you know. I absolutely did think that. Um... But, and and I've thought that even after I started school, when it, when times were really hard and I'm struggling and I'm working all these hours and I'm here super late and 
you know, all-nighters and studying for biology tests, you know, at 5 in the morning, and the janitor's kicking us out of shore. I've thought, you know, hey, dang, you know, if I would have just got to jump on things or, you know, even the, the idea of, you know, there's this common thing uh, amongst us artists where and Phil, Le oh, Phil, Phil Leitz, the homie, is always saying, this kid's 16 years old, can you believe it? You know, you get that thing where you see this young artist and everybody, like, subtracts five years off of his actual age. <laughs> says, you know, this guy's killing it, he's a beast, and he's, like, three years old. But, so that, that, that gets to you, you know, where you think, man, yeah. if I would have started, you know, when I was 18, 19, where would I be now, you know? Of course I've thought that. But I feel like I'm a very I'm I'm not like that anymore. Like I I think maturity has taught me that we're all on our own timeline. And so what about everybody else's? You know? Like yeah. competition is great. I love competition. But that that aside, hey, if you started studying anatomy three years before me, I really hope to God you're better than me at it. You know what <laughs> That's I mean? That's a great point. Mm -hmm. uh, but That's a really great point. The, here's, the, here's the other thing. I'm, I'm going to continue to study anatomy, so I'm going to get there, you know? Uh, and I'll get there when I get there, you know what I mean? So I'm really like, I'm at ease with it. I'm kind of at peace with the fact that my life has went the way it, it has went because of the choices I've made. And that's not to say you shouldn't, you know, weigh out your decisions and, and, and seek wise counsel. Uh, but then you made those decisions and, you know, you made your bed, dude, you know, like sleep in it. It's, it's all right. You know, like I'm a very decisive person and I feel like I learned a ton in my previous career. Uh, one of the things one of the most, I think, beneficial things was my work ethic was solidified through my previous career. Like I, I would have to be at a job site in the freezing bitter cold at 7 a.m. You have to be at the, the job box or the gang box ready to work with your tools on at 7 a.m. And... I was in an apprenticeship at the time, so I lived in Pueblo. I drove, I, had, I remember we had a job at north uh, end of Colorado Springs. I had to drive all the way up, probably an hour drive, in pitch dark morning to get to the job site by 7. I work all day till 3.30, but then I had apprenticeship school in Springs that night, so I would have to stay in Springs, not go back to Pueblo, go to school that night, and then drive home. So I would leave the house in pitch dark and drive home in pitch dark day after day after day. I, I had a job when I was first starting out in the trades where I worked in northern, northeastern Wyoming. It is the coldest, most miserable place I've ever been in my life. They said that uh, Wyoming, they use a 10-foot chain for a windsock because it's so windy up there, and they're not kidding. It's horrible. Um, I remember there, we were working on a power plant and I was working on some duct work on the floor of this, on one of the floors of this power plant, but it wasn't fully enclosed yet. The wind is whipping through, the floor is solid ice and I'm just freezing. My toes are freezing, I can't feel them. I, had, I did that for a lot of years. I really put in hard physical work and hard mental work to do these complex systems and I feel like that just gave me like a very strong work ethic and I was able to come here and it wasn't this big deal to be in a heated room working on art for six hours. You know what I mean? <laughs> so absolutely dude, my, my, my life went the way it went, you know, and I don't regret any of it and you know, I've learned a lot, and I'll continue to learn, and I've done a lot, and I'll continue to do, you know? That's all. Yeah, you said a lot of a lot of good shit to pull away from on that, because that, that's a tough, tough mindset to do. That's something that I'm, I, I've been working on recently, because even, 
even that just the, the three years that I was kind of goofing around or I went to two years at Texas State and I wasn't doing any art. And it was, it was a tough one to kind of get over the fact because I'd always go back to, man, if I would have had this dedication that I have now three years ago, what level would I be, be working at? But it goes back to exactly what you said. Everyone is on their own path and you're learning all these experiences. You know, like, yeah, this guy's 18 and he's fucking awesome. But, well, you know, it's like Dylan, yeah. right? Dylan, like, he's 17, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dylan is like, get out of here. Years old and just rock Dylan's been fun. doing it for like 10 years and he's only 17. <laughs> yeah, he has to go to bed soon, actually. We can't. <laughs> we got to cut this short. It's uh, bedtime coming up. No. <laughs> no, but you're right though, you know, you got to just relax, you know, it's easy to be like, oh, so-and-so is just doing this and doing that and these people are over here doing this because there's so many amazing artists out there, um, it tends to be overwhelming, you know, um, I think in that respect, the internet age is, is kind of our, our enemy in the past, it'd be a lot harder for you to see what everybody else was doing and you'd be easier It'd be easier for you to focus on your development and your work, but we're just bombarded with at the click or touch of a button of of everybody that, else's work. That is so so true and weird at the same because it's awesome because you you're, you have access to all this information mm -hmm. and it's easy to learn, but at the same time it's like a double edged sword because you yeah. are you see all these awesome you know young kids killing it and can be depressing and at the same same time. Um, Oh shit! Where where was I going with this? Uh, well, it's depressing, but it keeps you motivated, right? Yeah, yeah. definitely, yeah. definitely. It does. It's it it is. It's a double-edged sword. You know, it's it's great to see it, but I think it's it's also we need to have this mindset of let's go back to time. Time is absent from that because you just click. You know, instant gratification generation, right? We just click on it, and we go, wow, look at this amazing. Uh, work of art, and I think the general popula populace does this too. They look at this work of art, have no idea what went into it, no idea how much time it took, and they they pass judgment, you know, on it immediately. And we do the same thing, and that's what I mean. Time is is not in the equation. We don't process. We do more so now because we've been through the trenches. Uh, no pun intended. Uh. But you know, we we do because. We, we know what it takes to do this stuff, but even still, you have to keep that in your mind that you don't know how much time this kid's put into this. You don't know what they've done, what they've studied. You don't know what their responsibilities are. Um, so just remind yourself of that, and I think you, you can balance it out, you know? Like, this looks great. You know what I'll do, too, in that respect, is I'll spend some time looking at things, getting inspiration, and then I'll just get away from it. I'll just, I won't sit there for three hours looking at artwork. I'll like find, you guys are probably the same way, but I have like a huge collection of artists' work that I love, super organized in a folder uh, on my computer. Um, and I, like the other day, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this guy, but his name's Scott Wills. He's done a ton of background work for a bunch of cartoons, Ren and Stimpy, Samurai Jack, uh, Star Wars, The Clone Wars, um, the Road to El Dorado, tons of background work. He's a phenomenal painter. Uh, in like a simplified cartoonist style, I love his work. It's beautiful. And I just was searching him, and I just like was collecting a ton of his images from my personal reference folders. And I did that for maybe like an hour, and then I would just, all right, I'm done. And I did like my own work, or I did a study, or whatever, you know. So it's cool, but... You just have to be able to, like, take inspiration from it and then step aside back to your own pursuits, you know? Yeah, it's, it's easily to get caught up. And I think that's a lot, a lot of stuff that's going on because everyone has access to everyone's art and stuff. It's really easy to get overly influenced by one person's art. So instead of finding your your own voice, mm -hmm. kind of get caught up in someone else's voice. Are you, oh, that's fucking cool. I want to do this. And mm -hmm. it's... You know, and that's that's something like you're saying. You didn't have to worry about that back in the day when there's no internet. Yeah. Like it was just you and your your easel or whatever. And it well, had you know, you'd have a limited supply of things, and you pinned up these guys' illustrations you cut out of a couple magazines and stuff, and you had yeah. those. But it wasn't just like this alt, you know, unlimited source of anything you could ever imagine. It can be a distraction, is the point, and I think you really gotta 
you got to say, all right, that's enough of that. Because you learn by studying others, but you also learn by doing. So you just have to balance it out. Like study, look, observe, and then do, you know? Yeah, the, the problem I think a lot of people can, can run into is, because it, it's a lot easier to learn by looking than it is by doing it. And, and in that sense, I mean, like, you just kind of use that as, as an excuse. You're like, oh, I'm learning, I'm learning. But you're just looking at fucking art all day. You're not, yeah. <laughs> that's the best way to learn is by actually doing the thing. Just do the damn thing. Well, like, yeah, so my son, my oldest son, Joseph, right, he's, he, I, I really feel like he's going to be an artist. I don't, I don't. I'm not big on, like, making, you know, predictions or whatever, but he's really into art. He draws all the time, um, and he likes video games a lot, and as we know, you know, video games are all centered around artistic creation in all its different forms, and so he's into, like, a lot of, like, I gave him my old school, like, Sega Genesis, and he has all my old games and everything, so he likes all those old school stuff, and he likes to draw them, and for the longest time, he was drawing Sonic the Hedgehog, just from his memory, right? Just from all the times he played the game. <laughs> and I was like, well, I said, hey, Joe, I said, you know, artists use reference, you know? And he was like, well, what's that? I said, well, you, you gather images and you use those. You look at them, you study them, and you use those to help you create your own art, you know? You learn by studying and observing other, other art and, and other things. And I said, well, let's start, you know, some reference folders for you. So I like, on my not on my computer because I don't want him touching mine, but on my wife's computer, and she gets mad at me for it. I made a folder for him, for his it's Joe's reference, right? So every once in a while he'll go, Dad, you know, let's let's look up some reference, and we'll go and uh, what do you want to look up and we'll look up and save all these images and put them in folders for him. But he got into this habit where. He used to then he'd pull it up and he'd draw you know Bowser from Mario Brothers or whatever, but now he's kind of getting into this habit where he doesn't really draw much. He just likes looking at all the references that we <laughs> And I'm like, Joe, you got to use them, dude. You know, you got to draw from them, you know. So I think the same thing applies with us, you know. Just balance it out. Look at stuff, collect stuff, draw inspiration, but then set that aside and do, you know. No doubt. Get it. Nice. Well, did we get? Did we have any more talking points? We 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 had some really like dense like conversations, some good dense conversation there. We haven't made fun of you for your c coffee. I don't know. Oh, that, did Grant put that on there? Oh yeah, that was, that it's not was coffee, dude. We we hear that you drink a uh, Milky Way sugar coffee, Tony. Oh, that's, that's what's that all about? Milk, actually. <laughs> <laughs> It's just, you know, it's, just, it's, it's, it's not even liquid. It's just so congealed with sugar. <laughs> you know, it's out. Uh, you know, actually, that's awesome. That's funny, dude. Is I'm like, I'm trying to like, you know, wean myself off of so much sugar in my coffee, dude. So I'm like, I've stepped it back a couple scoops recently. <laughs> just a couple scoops. Is that that? There's there's something we can get into right here on the on the health because I'm 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 doing the same thing I'm trying to wean myself off of coffee and uh, energy drinks and shit and I've, I've been switching to black tea and I'll drink about like but I don't know how well it's working because I'm drinking like ten ten tea cups a day or some shit that I I have fallen into that same kind of pit because I every once in a while we get like junk food and shit over here. And I just decided, like, okay, let's let me cut that out. I don't need that. Let me let me try this other stuff that I never like. I never got before. So I started buying mangoes, and recently I started getting uh, like those fruit leathers, like the fruit preserve leather stuff. And I got one. You could buy them individual strips for like twenty five cents or whatever. So I got one just to try it. I hadn't had one of those since I was a kid, and I loved it. And now I'm buying them like three, four boxes at a time and finishing them in a few days. And it's, it's bad. It's like I thought I was trying to be healthy, and that's just turned into a new addiction. 100% sugar. <laughs> it's so just sugar. I personally feel like, I, and I don't know if it's it's uh, something associated with artists, but I just have an addictive personality. Like no. I, oh, so I just, I used to smoke uh, for a lot of years. I did that, and I quit. I've been, I, I've quit smoking for over a year yeah, now. I was, I was about to go into that, and like this, this motherfucker, like 
you, you've been doing this for years, and you're you're smoking like three or four like blacks a day or something like this, right? Cigars, yeah. Yeah, cigars. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm talking to him, and he's like, yeah, I think I'm going to quit. And he just fucking cold turkey that shit. <laughs> like, who does this? Because, I, you know, I had my own addictive tendencies to nicotine, and it's, you know, off and on sort of deal. But I tried cold turkey, and I don't – fuck, man, that's hard as shit. Like, well, you know, actually, you helped me out a lot, actually, because of your, like, sunflower seeds. Because <laughs> oh, that, was, that was what helped me out, you know, and talking about, like, just trading one addiction for another – Mm-hmm. Is that sodium intake? I I just start. I I, always, I play baseball when I was young a lot, and I used to just I chew seeds a lot, and I like them, and so I just like switch that for seeds, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I I'm just that way. I like you guys talking about getting off coffee or whatever. I love coffee. I love I coffee. drink it <laughs> daily. Uh, you know, uh, every day, even in the hot, hottest days of the summer, I drink coffee, and, and I love it. So, I don't know, I, you got to find a balance, you know. It's like, you try to be healthy. I think exercise is really important, especially for us, where we're sitting at a dang computer. All fucking day. All day long, you know. Like, when I quit smoking last summer, I just got my mountain bike fixed up, and I just went every day. Well, it's six days a week. I just started riding, and I thought I was going to die the first day, but little by little, you know, you you just you build up that. But I think that really, really helps you because you you your mind and your body and all that is connected. So if you're not exercising the one part of it, the other part's not being stimulated in that way either. So I find, like, if you can just take some time out in your day to actually exercise. Like lately I've been doing push-ups or whatever. I know it may sound funny, but I'll just – it takes a minute, two minutes to do – I'm up to like 45 push-ups, you know? No big deal. Uh, but no big deal, you know? But still, take some time aside and just do some physical exercise. Do something physical. You'll feel so much better. Yeah. Yeah, that's this is something I've recently recently started doing. Because before, like you always have this excuse, like, man, I don't have time to work out. I'm mm-hmm. not gonna have time for this. That's one more thing I'm gonna have to juggle. I won't be painting. I'm not gonna get my shit done. Mm-hmm. But when I started doing it, I've started doing just like like little simple workouts. Um, I'll do a 20 minute. Uh, as soon as I get out of bed, I'll I'll do a 20 minute workout, like YouTube workout. There's all kinds of free stuff. Like Mike mm-hmm. Mike Chang, like he's all over YouTube. You make fun of him and shit, but he's got some good fucking intense like 20 minute five minute workouts that you can just start your day with yeah and what that does like it just and, and by doing the workouts it's also cut back on my my uh caffeine as well because it just builds up your metabolism it energizes you mm-hmm. like you wake up it wakes you up you get the blood flowing you do your it takes 20 minutes out of your day you do your workout and then you know you're good to go and then and then in the middle of the day I'll also do like a 10 minute i got I recently got a a uh, heavy bag that I've been punching on. So once I started getting fucking tired of shit, usually I'd like. Start Is there a Dylan's picture on there? Yeah, <laughs> probably. No. Picture of Dylan. It's all like ripped up. There's darts stuck in it. You wear lipstick when you punch it. Cut out his eyes. <laughs> Fuck that guy. I just I had that vision of Billy Madison or whatever, where that guy's crossing everybody off his list. <laughs> but no, seriously, it's true. And, and I feel like it's easy for us to neglect that side of things, but it's important to get exercise. You know, there was, there was a uh, – actually, this might be it here. Uh, yeah, there was, actually. There's a um, post on Muddy Colors uh, that was authored by Mark Sheff, uh, and it was posted back in April. We'll make sure to put the link up in the on the blog and on the YouTube page or whatever. Um, but it was it, – the, the blog post or whatever was called The Art of Fitness, um, and it was fitness and food strategies for freelancers and busy people mm. and lazy people, he said, <laughs> um, which is kind of cool. I mean, he had this, you know, little 20 minute workout uh, that he does on top of, uh, you know, eating right and, and all that other fun stuff. Um, but it was, you know, this this workout that he sort of did and designed specifically for freelancers because of exactly that. Everyone's sitting in a chair for. 8, 10, 12, you know, 14 hours a day, whatever it is, um, and and they're not getting, you know, the the exercise that they, they used to. Like, that was something that I recognized 
happened the minute I started doing the freelance stuff. Because uh, I used to be on track back in high school. I would skate almost, I don't know, usually every other day. Um, and if it wasn't going to the skate park, it was uh, I had my, my practice rail that I'd have out in the cul-de-sac at my parents' place. Uh, all of that pretty much came to a halt the minute I started freelancing. Um, and I, I don't know if it was more like, I lost interest in that stuff or I just convinced myself like I don't have time for that anymore. I need to cut the fat and focus on, on the work. Uh, it certainly felt that way because, you know, it was, it was a grind trying to make money and, and, you know, earn a living and get out of my parents' place and get an apartment and all that stuff. Um, but now that that's happened, uh, I'm, I'm trying to find ways to make time for, for activities like that. Whether it's, I mean, we, a few weeks ago we went hiking up in Boulder uh, which was really fun, but you know that was one time, one weekend, and I haven't done it since. I, I need to get more of a regular schedule when it comes to that stuff. So yeah, um, well, it's you're right, dude. You do, and for me, like I have this plan um, for when I graduate, which I'm sure a lot of us have this stuff. But like as as soon as I'm freed up and I'm no longer obligated for all these classes and things that I've been in for the last four years. I have a schedule, you know. Um, it entails all these different things, and one of the one of them is a study schedule, uh, just for studying, doing studies as an artist, just to build and keep my skills sharp and and expand my skills and stuff. But what I'm going to do with that study schedule is keep it very organic, very uh, spontaneous and intuitive. I don't want. I've had a very rigorous schedule for a lot of my life and we have those in all these other areas and as far as my studying I want to do whatever it is I feel like doing whenever I feel like it so I think that same kind of thing can apply to to exercise for my personality it tends to get stale and not everybody might not be like this but when everything is in its proper slot or whatever it kind of gets stale so as far as exercise is concerned or studying artistically, I feel like be spontaneous, you know? And I think that's one of the things that's actually really good about a freelance career is you have a little more freedom in that respect. I've basically worked at a studio, but it was just in construction where I had to be there at this time till this time and then I went home. But as a freelancer, you can say, hey, I finished for the day. I'm just going to go do whatever, you know, um, or I know I don't have to have this done till midnight and I have some time right now. I'm just going to go for a run or I'm going to go for a ride or whatever right now, you know. I think that's really cool to have that freedom and be spontaneous and just keep things loose, you know, and not be so um, – from 11.30 to 12.45 is my workout time every day. You know what I mean? For some people, that might be the way to go. For me, I like to keep it a little more loose than that. I like the add-on. Well, I mean, definitely everything you're saying, spot on. Uh, but as a resource, before I forget, um, there, there's also another resource on Facebook, a Facebook group called uh, Game Dev Fitness. Uh, now I know that speaks more to game world, but it really doesn't matter because basically they just post, a, you know, kind of links to, to, you know, desk exercises and all sorts of workouts if you're really into that. But to go along with what you guys are also saying, I think it's really important, um, you know, because also like Dylan, like I was pretty active way back when, played like Division One tennis. So like I, I was like, you know, <laughs> subjected to a, like a lot of demanding work. You know, I uh, played on scholarship for four years at the University of Toledo, and, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. I only bring that up because, you know, like you were saying, Anthony, like, it's important to be, you know, spontaneous and not neglect these things because, you know, retrospectively looking, all of these things, like, tie into you as an individual and artist. Like, I never would have, like, thought, you know, a long time ago that, like, oh, like, playing tennis or playing a sport or, or doing anything like that would affect me like later, but that's such bullshit because mm -hmm. I learned discipline. The discipline I have now as an artist, I learned as an athlete. You mm -hmm. know, like yep. the, the, the struggles that I go through, you know, when I'm lifting, you know, I can directly apply those to like stuff when I'm doing art. So like it's very, very important not to fall into the trap of like I just don't have time because yeah. I definitely 
that, and I learned the hard way, like like every you know most people. Yeah. You, know, you feel you find that out the hard way. It's like a lot of time. You're just trying to grind, grind, grind all day. But like at a certain point, like you start fighting yourself because mm-hmm. you know without like a healthy body or healthy mind, like you're never gonna make like you know healthy art. I would say, but absolutely, you're never art, you know, like all these like little little tiny things like tie in and. Yeah, I was just adding on, you know, it's really important not to neglect these things. And it doesn't just have to be working out. It could be anything. Like, you know, I'm really into, like, um, you know, I'll take, you know, 20 minutes just by myself and, and like, you know, I'll sit upright. I'll do all those, you know, med- meditation things. Mm-hmm. But, like, every, like, little, little thing you do, you know, like, that's where, you know, huge impacts, like, later on down the road that, like, you can't even see now. But, like, you'll look back and be like, holy shit, like, you know. I learned this from that, or I was able to, like, you know, figure this out, you know, this this creative problem, you know, from something minuscule, <laughs> like, way back when, and I don't know, I think it's really important, so just to add on. Absolutely, know. dude. I agree, and I think um, what I think is the most important thing that I kind of learned from it, and I knew this back when I was younger and I was very active physically, um, but I relearned it again recently, um, is that when you push your everything is connected so when you push your body physically and you're able to achieve things it strengthens your mind mm-hmm. you realize I can do it you know um, I remember I started riding my bike again and like I said I, I thought I was gonna die the first day I went out there I had smoked for like six years and then I went trying to hit hills in Colorado in the summer on my mountain bike and it was very hard but as I kept at it and kept at it I was able to take these same hills that I once was almost dying on a lot quicker right and once you do that your mind is strengthened you realize I can handle stuff but I think when you neglect yourself physically you start to suffer mentally because you start to doubt your capabilities um, as an individual and that's why I think physical stimulation physical uh, goals are very important for us mentally we have to have both of that you know what I mean if, if you're just I don't know personally I just felt weaker because I wasn't uh, challenging myself physically but then once I started to do that I started to realize my strength and it wasn't just physical strength, you know, it was my mental strength as well. So I think that's important to yeah, point I out. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, you know, because you know, with, with the same thing, I think it's, it's good to just have an outlet that isn't art in general. Mm-hmm. Because if you're just cranking and burning, you know, the midnight candle or whatever, just on all you do is art. Like, your brain is just going to be fucked. Because yeah. I've, I've tried that method. You're like, oh, I'm going to learn so much stuff. But then you just get caught in, like, this weird loop of brain-dead art, and you're just kind of going through the motions, but you're not learning anything. Like, Because I used to do this with studies, you know. Like, you were talking about switching it up. Like, I was like, oh, I'm just going to do nothing but portrait studies mm-hmm. and old master copies. Mm-hmm. And then it was fun at first, but eventually you're like, oh, well, now I have to do another one of these fucking studies. And then... <laughs> You don't enjoy it, so you're just kind of going through the motions, and you're not yeah. really learning on the subtleties of the colors and the values. You're just kind of like copying without mm-hmm. really thinking about why they're they're doing that. Yeah, it's so diversity. You, know, you need to keep things fresh, and, and that's what I mean. You step aside, you do push-ups, or you do go for a bike ride, or you know, um, the yeah, go do something else. You know, uh, you want your life to be diverse, you know? Too much of one thing is always bad, you know? Wise words. All right. Nice, man. All right, well... We were supposed to give uh, Grant compliments. That was on the list, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is the new... Specify the new you're so tall. Company. I, have to, I mean, I feel like you didn't really dig deep very much on that one, but this is going to be the new chapter of uh, In the Trenches at the end of the podcast. Everyone has to compliments because, yeah. <laughs> I like your glasses, Grant. You purple glasses. Right there. There. <laughs> Grant doesn't wear glasses. He has these purple sunglasses that are beautiful. Uh, my, my shades that I wear while I paint. Oh, stunning shades. Stunning shades while I paint. Fine color. <laughs> Yeah, Grant sounds like a daddy, just so you know. So. Your taste in music is impeccable. How's that? 
There you go. Now, now we're now we're now we're feeling it, guys. Keep going. Uh, you're you're not Hitler. Oh my there you god. Go. That's there you go. That that uh, sunflower seed habit that you had while healthy was fucking disgusting to sit next to at school. Yeah. You'd have a spit cup oh. filled with. Uh, no, because he'd have tree and sunflower seeds roast. at the same time. <laughs> This is an animal. All right, we, we, we definitely went off the topic of compliment. <laughs> <laughs> we'll work on it. We'll work on it. We'll get it down. A little That's good and then a little bad. bad. A little good and then a little bad. A little sweet and then a little sour. Yeah, I mean, I guess you don't want to inflate my ego too much because I definitely get. Yeah. You know, you got to keep me modest. Keep me modest, guys. Right. I appreciate it. Nothing keep but you grounded. Life. Keep you uh, grounded. Yeah. <laughs> Healthy. All right. Well, All right. right on, guys. I appreciate you for uh, interviewing me. Hopefully, I was able yeah. to help some people. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Yeah. Thanks to thanks to Jay and having me. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. And uh, yeah, next time, if you want to get on here again, Tony, like after graduation and figuring out, talking about like game plans after graduation or. You know the the new career path and any kind of planning that takes or whatever, man. Uh, should get back on there. And we'll, we'll talk yeah, about let it. me know, guys. I'd love to do it again. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. And uh, cool. we're gonna post uh, your website, I think, uh, with the video. But you could announce it here if you've got any place you want. Like yeah. People can go and check out your work, get to know you a little better. Yeah, that'd be great. It's just Anthony M, as in Michael Benedetto, dot com. So awesome. Yeah, Jay, what are you plugging? Jason, J-A-Y-S-O-N, Miller.com. Just Jason Miller.com. Awesome. Easy. Word. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, guys. This was fun. Thanks, buddy. Uh, and, uh, if we, uh, I just want to say, too, if, we, if, if anybody's looking for any more resources on this time management, um, I don't know if you guys have some, but I think Anthony Jones comes up a lot. The dude is doing crazy things with a crazy demanding lifestyle um, and uh, he's he's got a handful of uh, live streams uh, I'll see if I can find which ones uh, he spoke to about the time management stuff but Zach's right that guy we got a chance to meet him out at GDC back in March and and talk with him a little bit and just I don't know his his schedule same thing he's got a family he's working at Blizzard he's trying to push his own project he's doing freelance stuff he, right now, he's doing a ton of tutorials that he's been posting up on Gumroad, uh, which you guys can buy for pretty cheap. But I, how he keeps his schedule in order, essentially, is you know a lot of the same stuff that Anthony went over. So it's it's pretty clear that once once you have a workload that you know demands that much of you, uh, you you start to figure things out pretty quick. So <laughs> I think these guys have done really well, and it's it's been cool to, to hear Anthony, and we'll be sure to post up whatever links we can. Um, about time management stuff, definitely, definitely. Yeah, it's definitely been. It's really interesting to hear your story. I had no idea that that those were your, that was your beginnings. There. Oh, cool. I appreciate it, guys. It's a pleasure. Right on. All right. Until next time. Cool. Take care, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>